Yeah, go ahead, Clark. A couple quick comments and then one question. Um, I would offer that the marketing issue that you all both and several of you talked about probably is the biggest challenge. And, and I would also suggest that what Tom's talking about is, is the circumstance, kind of the, 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 the hand we've been dealt, we're just gonna have to deal with that. But if we broaden that interest in pipeline to some extent, we're going to generate more interest and people who want to do and what you want to are suggesting now makes a lot of sense. I don't know if you probably at some point or some of you have seen some of these transportation programs on the History Channel, building bridges. I mean, they're fascinating. And I don't think they're fascinating just to me because I, I know about transportation. I think they'd be fascinating to a lot of people. And then to Keith's point, uh, we, one of the things we're, we're trying to get to, and we all need to work on this, is that kind of pathway for a young person, a student. Okay, I, I go, I see what, what the engineer does when you come into your company, and then I go home and play a video. Well, what else, what else can I do? What's kind of my, my next step? Then the other, uh, second comment is, uh, we always have been challenged with kind of how we penetrate the education system with all of these competitions. Teachers don't have enough time, all these things. The Department of Education has embarked on a, what they call a, a, a career clusters program, and one of the high uh, need industries identified as transportation. They don't have money to invest in that. We did take a limited amount, not a lot, there wasn't a lot there, of this education grant money, and gave more money to the University of Mississippi, uh, uh, Missouri, sorry Angie, Missouri, right over here, uh, to work with Southern Illinois, University of Southern Illinois, to develop a transportation career cluster program. And that's great as a pilot, but the success of that effort is going to depend on the participation of both the public and private sector uh, in that program. So when you've got a more structured approach, going to the education system and saying, here's something you can use in your curriculum, will we respond by having people come in, by getting uh, programs and so on? One of the biggest challenges that I've seen across this effort is we're so sporadic. ASHTO has its track program, AGC has its build-up program, uh, ASCE, Society of Civil Engineers, has uh, a program, and their West Point Bridge Point kind of program. So how do we kind of get all of our hands around this, our arms around this, so we can start to see a, a pathway? So those are my comments. That career clusters program might be a real opportunity for us, a more structured approach to penetrate uh, the, uh, the education system. Here was my question, though. We've talked a lot, and it's true certainly, about the new skill sets and broadening the skill sets for, for engineers, for communication, assistance building, finance environment, and all that. Um, we've seen a shift, I would dare say, in the state DOTs to more project management oversight, much like we had in Federal Highway with the states. Those technical skills are there that are now being reside in the project actual development at the, at the uh, uh, private sector consulting industry. So my question is, is there a distinction in your all's mind between the private sector and the state DOT need in terms of these broader skill sets, um, or is it is it pretty much the same, a one size fit all? When we say to the education community, this is what we need, we need this broader skill set, do we need to focus a little differently whether it's private sector or, or state DOT or public sector or not, or, or just get that message out and try to get those skills developed and then let them decide which way they're gonna go. I've always been a strong advocate of concentrating on the, the fact that we are all part of the transportation industry and concentrating less on that which would divide us. You're with an agency, I'm with a consultant, you're with a contractor, you're with a university. We aren't big enough, there aren't enough of us as it is to worry about lobbing grenades over the wall at each other. I'm much more, and now with the, the skilled labor uh, situation, our workforce needs coming under even more, uh, even sharper focus, I feel that way even more today. I believe, certainly, there are some agencies that are going more to the oversight, and therefore that technical work has to move down. Within the uh, consulting community, there's actually moved to to move some of that, which had been engineer tasks to now engineering technician tasks. There's always the need to, you know, do things as effectively as possible. It's always going to be evolving, but what isn't going to change is the fact that we are responsible for delivering uh, that U.S. DOT mission statement up there, that fast, safe, and reliable transportation system, and we all have a stake in that. 
I think if we, we do have to find a way to band together as we talk to uh, higher ed and then in, term, in turn to K through 12 to do a better job of saying what it is we're looking for. And, and the, the phrase that we have adapted for the effort that I, I lead in southeastern Wisconsin, uh, and granted that's an overall STEM perspective, that's not just specifically transportation engineering, is collaborate now, compete later. Uh, the, HNTB and CH Tuam Hill are always going to compete, when we're not teaming together, that is. Uh, different <laughs> agencies are, are going to compete in a sense. In, in the broader perspective, I work with the manufacturing community. Johnson Controls and Rockwell Automation are going to compete. And that's when you're competing for talent. That's when you're competing for projects or contracts. But when you're talking about K-12 outreach, and you're talking to fifth graders or seventh graders or ninth graders or whatever, that's not the time to compete. That's the time to collaborate. That's the time to work towards a singular mission that we can all get behind and make it so that it has credibility and that passion that we can get the kids interested. We can't just think that we're going to go to a career day once a year and that get those kids so excited, show all the sexiness of our industry that that's going to tide them over and all of a sudden that one event in seventh grade or eighth grade is going to make their mind up. Not with all the distractions. It was never that way and especially today with all the distractions and the competition we face. I think we need to work together to come up with that singular mission, collaborating rather than competing, and working together to develop a continuum that grows up with these kids. And then, you know, something that has ex initial exposure in, in K through five, and it becomes more refined towards some curriculum base or, or supplemental curriculum options in middle school on into the more developed curriculum, like a project lead the way in the high school level, leading into internships. We've got to do that, but we have to do it in a methodical fashion so that they're not getting approached and they're not confused by all what appear to be competing efforts. Now's the time for us to come together as an industry, uh, not just with respect to building that infrastructure, but in terms of developing the workforce that will deliver that infrastructure. I really agree with that because I don't really think it's as much about we don't have people who want to be in transportation as it is we don't have one, we don't have people who want to be in, in science and math and technology. And I don't know if that's because it's hard um, do, are, we, are we graduating a disproportionate amount of people in some general business degree category, or I don't know. But, um, but we don't have kids who are, who are seizing on the opportunities that are, can be associated with science and technology. And they may think it's cool to play a video game, and they may you know, conceptually think it would be cool to design one, but they haven't latched on to the discipline that it would take to get them into that job uh, or to a related job. So um, I think if you get them interested in something that is science, technology, math related, that the market forces will take care of where they end up working. But you have to get them early enough to care about that or whatever it is that, you know, you hear the same arguments, we don't have anybody who wants to be teachers. We don't have anybody who wants to be dentists. We don't have anybody who wants to be, you fill in the, in the blanks. I bet there's a, you know, there's a, a, a panel or whatever, you know, every day of the week, somebody's going on about how, well, the industry I'm in, nobody wants to do that. Where are we gonna do? And it's got to do with the declining availability of a workforce in total, so, um, I, I really believe science and technology and math are in the long run going to serve us very well regardless, and we will figure out how to work smarter if we can get kids who want to do those things. I'll pass this along, but it just reming, brings up another point. It's absolutely in 100% agreement with Roberta. Bring up these competencies of our youth and leave, it's all about options. If they've got this ba strong background in science and math, they're open to do anything. God forbid, some of them are gonna become attorneys. We just can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> but there's not, a, other than that, there's no other downside to providing a strong basis in math and science. And there's no reason why we as professionals in this field can't exert our collective and combined strengths to help make that happen in the K-12 system. Can I, can I take the conversation in just a little bit different direction here? 
Uh, as we go out and, and uh, make our case that transportation is, is uh, exciting, and I, I, I heard uh, the last two comments there about we have to make math and science more exciting as well. But what, what is the image that, uh, what is our image of ourselves in terms of what we do? Example, um, I uh, talked to three CEOs. Two of them spent more time talking to me about land use planning than they did about building stuff. Uh, one of them spent a lot more time talking to me about project management than he did about building stuff. Uh, two of them spent a lot more time talking about finance than about building stuff. Are, are, are agencies still in the building business primarily? Uh, or if you sign on with the DOT, might you spend more time ensuring that uh, slurry seals are done correctly? Uh, and that uh, traffic signals are working, uh, then you will uh, helping to build the Brooklyn Bridge. I, I think it'll be a combination of things, uh, Ernie. I, I don't think we're getting out of the construction business, so we have to be careful that we're not uh, sending that message. Um, I think we are going to see this shift to more uh, maintenance and, and operations, and I think many of the DOTs are, are moving aggressively uh, in, in that uh, direction. Um, certainly project management is a, is a whole lot of more important than maybe what it was uh, a, a few years ago and, and the work and the collaboration we do with the consulting uh, industry uh, for design and construction engineering and, and with, the, um, with the construction uh, industry. Our key transportation managers today are big time project managers. I mean, that's what we're doing. We're, we're relying on our, our partners in the private sector. They're very critical to the whole success. I, I thought Van hit it uh, on the head real well with his last comments uh, on how we're partners in all of this and no one party does this work together. We, we all work together to, to build a transportation system and maintain it. And, uh, and But at the DOT level, project management is very important today and um, many of our employees who years ago were involved in a construction boom, you know, today we're not doing at that level and, and they're more managing projects for us instead of actually doing the work themselves. Um, so we will see a lot of that. Uh, on the design side of our business, it's probably 50-50. We probably design half of our projects in-house and half of them are done by consultants. And we think that's a good, good mix and, and gives us a lot of benefits and certainly helps the consulting industry. Um, and, and there's a lot of benefits to that, uh, that approach and that model, but that requires that we be very good project managers. Our, our personnel have got to have those kinds of skills. Um, we are still going to build an occasional bridge here and there, and, and in our state we've we got a real big one in mind that we're, we're working on right now, and so that's, I think, exciting and, and cool, and, and that stuff won't go away. We'll, we'll continue to do that. And certainly as we reconstruct major parts of the interstate system, I mean, that's almost like building a new road. Not quite, but, but almost. And, uh, you know, that's, that's in the future, too. Um, for most of us, the in, interstate's 40 years old, and so we'll, we're going to, and I'm sure Roberta can speak to this, too. We got huge amounts of uh, projects and money set aside now that are going to have to be spent on, on reconstruction, and, and so those are major construction projects that we'll, we'll have, uh, have as well. Um, I forgot the third point, Ernie, what, what that was, but the two, land use, and, um, and certainly land use is driving a lot of what we do today and a lot, of, a lot more work with local governments and, and MPOs and, and uh, a lot of questions on, you know, do you have to build the road here or can it go somewhere else? Um, a, lot of, a lot of issues with that and so that's driving a lot of our personnel to, to work harder with local governments and, 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 uh, and think a lot more about land use in the future of, uh, of you know, the transportation system and, and, you know, should we use transit more? Should we do this? Should we do that? Um, what's the impact on land and the environment? And um, Roberta and I, earlier in the year, were in New Mexico for most of a week, um, and we talked a lot about climate change kinds of issues and um, how do we impact uh, uh, that whole issue in the transportation business and what more can we do with better planning and, and how can we have a better impact on, on, uh, on climate control? Um, with better planning and, and transportation. And so I think that'll be a real evolving part of that. And so we're gonna re require that our managers think a lot more about that and have more skills in those areas and stay up stay up on that area. And that's evolving all the time and, and very complex. And um, I think that'll be exciting to learn more about that. 
think you said something that was pretty interesting that just turned a light bulb on for me. I said something. Well, that's, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, we do talk a lot about all of those other things that go along with our industry. Um, I guess my question is, what excites the kids more? Mm -hmm. Is it about the collaboration and the project management and the, the dealing with the finance and how that all wraps together? Or is it about the construction and uh, the tangible result that helps the public, general public? And I think it really varies depending on the person. Mm -hmm. um, I did a webcast to about 700 people a couple weeks ago, and it was just kind of a quarterly, how are we doing type webcast. Okay, So from my perspective, I knew exactly what they wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. They wanted to know financial performance. They wanted to know where we are with our goals. They wanted to know uh, yeah, all that sort of stuff that was important to me. Okay, So after I was done, I received, I, I, I really encouraged the people, because these were individuals that were one year out of school, five years out of school, 30 years out of school. I encouraged them to give me some feedback because I want to hear what's going on with them, you know, what, what I need to do differently in the next one. So I ended up getting a, a variety of feedback. I, I, I said, wow, that's stuff that the person that I report to never talks about. I like hearing about that sort of stuff, and I want to hear more about it because I want to be more accountable and I want to have more input to the company's performance and all that sort of stuff. But I would have to say that probably two-thirds of the individuals came back and said, very informative, but can you talk more about some of the projects that we're doing and some of the outcomes that these projects have on individuals' lives and their communities and all that? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a mix of, of, of both of them. And that's why I keep saying I, I don't, I'm not sure if it's just it's, it's a branding effort, but I'm not sure it's just a one-size-fits-all to every individual as far as how do we do we talk about do we get them by talking about that whole project management, or do we get them by talking more about the outcome? You made it earlier, uh, and that kind of reinforces it, I guess. Uh, Roberta, you made a comment on an analogy of teaching. I have a daughter who loves to teach. She thought she did until she hit the administration. Now she's not so sure she really loves to teach. Are we doing something in the transportation industry like that? We hold up the pretty bridge, the tunnel, you know, the big, the big piece. But then we talk about performance measures. We talk about meeting with the public. We talk about doing a lot of things. Many times, engineers, you know, technical people don't like to do. Um, we talk about adding on new skill sets on top of the engineering and technical pieces, which could expand the, the learning time through a university, you know, every, you know, a technical curriculum is crammed full of, of courses and you hardly have time to do the, the soft skills. So in, in some way are we, are we fooling ourselves? Are, do we think we know what we want and then when people get there, they're really finding something different? Um, you know, are we walking the talk? I don't, I'm just kind of throwing that out as a, uh, you know, it is an item to kind of think about. Should we be doing more to survey students who might have an interest in STEM activities and find out those things that, that connect and think about what would the role in a transportation organization be, but then separate these other roles that are, you know, that can be a lot of different things and, and deal with them differently. It may not be a one size fits all. So, I just wanted to respond to this for quite some time. So. And I, you know, the, the longer I listen to this discussion, I think it's an excellent discussion. The more I realize it's not a one size fits all. And so, when you said that, I thought that's it. You know, um, I think we are think we are thinking about multidisciplinary teams, not multidisciplinary individuals, because they are two different things. Because as an educator, I'm sitting here thinking there's there are trade offs between breath and death. I, I, if, if we are going to go broad, it's going to be at the expense of something. The curriculum is just so long. 
So uh, for different organizations, you, you, you may be wanting to build some capabilities across the team. And it may mean that you want some individuals who sort of lean towards the depth. And then you want some who are broad. And they are all in there. And so then this, this starts to uh, you know, push up the idea of programs that bring out individuals, a range of individuals who can form those multidisciplinary teams. So, so I think, I think that's, that's really where we are going. Because I don't think you, the, the engineer without those soft skills and those people skills and uh, an understanding of the global economy and, and, and where the resources are coming from is, is, is uh, or a team without that understanding is going to be as competitive as one that has it. Now in that team, should everybody have all the, you know, the, the highest level of people? Probably not. Um, do you want some sound engineers who can do their designs? Absolutely. Do you want those engineers to be able to uh, communicate effectively? Yes, but that's a minimum standard. Do you want the people who can go out there and sell the project so effectively that you get the business? Yes, and those are the high-end people on the other side. So I think that says to educators that we must start to think about how to put these kinds of programs together that turn out multiple individuals that can build these strong multidisciplinary teams. Reaction? Anyone else? Yeah. Go ahead. I think that's true, and I think it gets back to what is it that you want to be? Because there was a time, and, and it still exists in Leon's organization, and it still exists in mine, that in order to be the district engineer, you have to be an engineer. Um, but the department director of MoDOT is no longer an engineer and doesn't have a transportation background except the one he brought with him from another state. Um, the chief financial officer of MoDOT is a CPA, but I don't crunch numbers anymore. And for me, you know, moving around in and through and up government, up into government, it was about my desire to be in a leadership role. There are people who have great technical skills in all of our organizations who don't want that and shouldn't have it thrust upon them in order to get the money they need to make a decent living. They are great technical people and that's all they will ever be and it's all they want to be. But there are people who need a technical background who also desire to do something else with their, with their lives in terms of being in a leadership role. And I think the, the thing that I think crosses all of those lines is that, that maybe is different from what we've had before, especially in government, is the need for accountability and performance. Um, in, in industry, if you didn't perform and if you weren't accountable, then you just went out of business. But in government, you didn't go out of business, you just had everybody hate you because you didn't, weren't producing a good product. So. We, we can know, people will not pay for what they want. We, we learned that last week when all of the states put together their, their wish list for an economic stimulus package and how many bazillions of dollars that was. There's no way we're going to get that big of a list. The money's not going to be there. So you have to have these soft skills to create the consensus for what you're going to get. And we still have to have those great technical people who are going to be able to get the project on the street in 180 days. So it, it's okay, and it's exactly right. This is not one size fits all. This is a multidisciplinary effort, and we have to have kids at the K through 12 and, and college and whatever level understand that you don't, we've got a role for you in transportation that will fit whatever it is you want to do, whether that be technical, whether that be leadership, whether that be um, planning, what, whatever that is. We've got a role because this touches everything. So as we work towards that collaborative spirit that I mentioned earlier, and we talk about that marketing effort, if I could just capture everything I've heard, Transportation, the transportation industry is not one, one size fits all. Pause for effect. And that's a good thing. I think we need to leverage that. I think that's a strength, not a weakness. 
I think those are both excellent comments uh, that we heard uh, t to the first one. I, I think it is important we don't oversell what we do. Uh, so that was a very good point, and, and thank you for making that. Um, I think it is uh, important that we give a realistic view of what our jobs are like. So we can't just show the fancy bridge that we're going to build and, and make it look more sexy than what it really is. But there's somewhere in between those extremes. I think we need to do more than what we're doing today. So that, that was a very good point, and, and thank you for that. And, and then to the, uh, to the point on the multi, multidisciplinary teams, I think that's an excellent point, too. And, and we started off this discussion to do some of that within our organizations. And so to the extent that universities can react to that and can incorporate some of that into the curriculum, I think that would be positive and, and helpful for all of us. And, and I'm just speaking to the DOTs, but I would imagine that would apply to the private sector uh, as well. I think that um, I couldn't agree more. I think that the, 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 the one package won't work. And let me give you an example. Um, about 15 years ago, I was ready to leave the industry. I was leaving, and I interviewed with a marketing firm in the Northeast. And my interview went like this for the day. Okay, I was picked up, taken to the place, handed a piece of paper, and said, you have 30 minutes to develop a PowerPoint presentation, and then you're going to give it in front of the owners of the company. Did that went to the next room, was given a piece of paper on a subject, said you have 30 minutes to write a two-page perspective on this. I did that, then I went back, and they, they, I did that, presented that, and then the third piece was you have these three people in the room here, work together, come up with a solution to this problem, and present it to the board. And then at the end of the day, then, so that was the morning. <laughs> So the afternoon was a little easier where I just went through the standard interviewing process where they shared with me the results. Now, how many of your students would like doing that? Not all of them. That would terrify some people. I was really excited about it, to be quite honest with you. I was very excited about that because that, only, that will only excite a certain type of individual. And we need both. We, we have to have the technical folks as the backbone. We have to have them. And they are so critical and so valuable that we can't stop pretending that it's not a technical. But I still think that there's another side to this that some, some folks, depending on their skill sets, would like to get more involved with those sorts of issues as well and can really blossom into that softer side and presentation skills and planning and, and all that. So it's it's not a prepackaged it, it's it's finding the kids, figuring out what they like to do, and then somehow, easier said than done, putting on some sort of a track to, 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 to go in that direction. The other aspect of the comment about are we walking the, the talk here um, goes back to one of Tom's comments early on. Are we are we hiring young people and putting them in, in the corner for four years, as he described? Uh, whether it's the, the high production at each NTB or just simply you have to put in your time at the DOT before you can be thought of as competent to go out and meet a, a client or a customer? Do we have a, do we have a cultural issue, I, I'm, I guess I'm asking? Any of you out there? I don't want to put the panel on the spot all the time. Roy, do you have a cultural issue in Wisconsin? We have a bit of a cultural issue. What, you know, in answer to your question, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to multitask this year. <laughs> <laughs> in answer to your question about uh, what we're doing with the young people, I don't agree with the comment that was made over here because I think we're throwing our new graduates into more complex work a lot sooner than when I came on almost 27 years ago. I think that the shrinking resources we have, the expectations to get more done, uh, less workforce, the whole bit, has forced us to put people into leadership roles sooner than we might have in the past. Uh, they're, they're developing as they go, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but I don't think there's any lack of challenge for our young people coming into the organization these days. Uh, in terms of culture, uh, I, I, I sat and listened to the different generations and I smiled because well, there are some, some challenges that you face with different expectations. I think there's also a richness by having that multi-generational workforce because I think they learn from each other. 
And if you, if you manage that right and you put people together on these cross-functional teams that we're talking about, you can see some pretty amazing things happen with the wisdom and the new knowledge that comes together. And so, just a couple comments there. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone on the back? Yeah. I agree with that. I think we are we are beyond the luxury of letting folks sit and think deep thoughts for five years or draw stuff for five years or um, work on the background of the financial plan for five years until they're ready. And, and I think we are calling upon our supervisors, experienced and unexperienced, inexperienced ones, to make those calls for us, to look at what excites our employees and to tap them on the shoulder and say, you're ready for the next thing. And that might be you're, that you're not ready until you've been doing it for four or five years, but it also might be, read, might be a, a circumstance where um, you can see the spark and you're saying, guess what, we're having a public meeting and you're coming along and you're gonna watch this next thing and you're gonna have an opportunity to interact with some stakeholders or customers or whatever. Um, you're gonna come with me to the meeting with the, the design consultants that we've hired for this because I want you to understand how it is from their side of the fence. I, I think we are certainly in Missouri beyond the point where we, we just don't have the, the resources to let those folks percolate for a long time. And kind of the uh, best of both worlds scenario and I acknowledge that this doesn't by definition affect every project or every person working for a consultant or for the DOT. But for those that have had the opportunity to have worked on one of the mega projects here in Wisconsin, which have embraced a true partnership effort between the private and public sector, um, working day to day in a project office, that has elevated, has had so many benefits, not the least of which is to uh, get that exposure from the youngest people on both of their staffs, not only to the opportunity to work with everything that's associated on a mega project, but also to break down those cultural divides that might exist between private and public sector. consultant staff working together to deliver a project and uh, you know and from the public side there's no doubt we are not going to see a huge growth in resources yet we see the emerging needs and the growing needs for infrastructure work so that means we're going to have to get it done with a different model and I think that model of having the DOT we have a role we have a responsibility for oversight and getting the resource together with the private sector is how we're going to have to deliver the future program and I don't, I don't see a problem with that. It does call for us doing things differently. As Van said, putting people in the same office has brought some challenges, but it also created some incredible opportunities for sharing, understanding, better communication. And I think that's what's going to happen. We're going to continue to evolve, and the line between the public and private sector is going to blur as we go forward. And one more. Yes. One I think the leadership in the organizations that recognize what Rory is talking about and, and actually move forward to do this will have a competitive edge. Um, because of the dwindling numbers of, of people, I mean, people are going to be expected to do more. Um, but also just simply, it's really moving towards a strengths management type of par paradigm, right? Because, I mean, there are seven people you don't want to go to the public mm -hmm. meeting and talk for your, you just don't. But on the other hand, if you put them there to design the bridge, you're going to do very well. And so I think it's, the onus is going to be on the leadership to really become discerning about how to recruit and together these kinds of teams to, to gain a competitive edge. And there's a very nice book on strengths management. It's called um, Now Discover Your Strengths, anyway, yeah, by uh, Clifton and Buckingham and Clifton. That does a good job describing this model. Okay. Yeah, when you talk about the, the team approach, uh, there's several kinds of teams. There's, there's the team, public and private sector, uh, in the room together working for a common purpose. There's the team of a bunch of engineers, some of whom are great technical folks and some of whom are, are great communicators. And then there may be the team of different disciplines. 
Anybody working with a different discipline approach? Tom? Oh, do you want me to say something about it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'm a, a faculty member. I work in a research institute. We have meteorologists, uh, journalists, uh, you know, you name it, that work with, with us on, on projects. And I've had students that actually were meteorologists going through the meteorology master's program and worked on our projects. Uh, we once had an attorney on our staff uh, that dealt with public policy. Uh, when I was a consultant, you know, we knew that the engineers were not very good at public involvement. So I had a little fire plug of a woman that, that just was, you just loved to meet her. Just was all smiles. And she took care of all of our public involvement, wrote our newsletters, uh, helped uh, our web designer with the web page. And uh, yeah, we had to have the engineers around in case somebody asked something that she couldn't explain. But by and large, and I don't even know what her background, I don't even know if she has a degree. <clears throat> now, I guess the reason I asked that question is, are, are we training our young professionals to interact well in that kind of team environment? Is that is that something that you, you folks see as, as your... They I have to. Our, I mean, we, we spend, uh, you know, our undergraduates spend most of their life figuring out how to beat up on the other guy. Mm -hmm. They're competitive. We grade on curves. We, you know, we, we don't, uh, you know, naturally I think every university in the country has talked about the need to do uh, teamwork kinds of things. And to, you know, at our capstone project, I teach a, uh, a graduate class on consulting. Uh, that, that in those activities, yes, we stress teams, but by and large, they're on their own. Um, if you win, I lose. You know, I saw I, a whole bunch of people shaking their head in the opposite direction when I asked the question, so. I think with this, the I-94 project, good example, right? Um, and it has the, um, the motto, basically, of leave your business card at the door, right? So you walk around there, you don't know who's from which consultant or who's from the DOT, and that model's getting more and more popular. So we better figure out how to play good in the sandbox together because that motto, I mean, that, that model is, is it's very effective for one, to be quite honest with you. It is very effective. MoDOT uses that model now a lot as well. Yeah, um, especially on major projects. Mm -hmm. Certainly we have consultants and um, DOT folks, but then the DOT folks are not just the engineers. We have embedded uh, public relations people. We have embedded accountants on that team, and for the you know the length of the I-64 rebuild in St. Louis, for the length of the KC Icon project in Kansas City, those folks are working together from all those disciplines to make this project successful. Well, and I think that the public is demanding that, that they had, it, they're demanding it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the more with less. But is that I, a typical model these days? The bigger the project. So if someone comes into a DOT organization, is that how they can expect their work to be on a day-to-day -day basis? Or is this kind of those examples that have been set aside based upon need? And while you know 95% of the organization is the traditional organization, only these 5% work in that team environment. Well, maybe I can respond from a Wisconsin perspective. Even on our, our three, what we call our 3R projects, our rehab type projects, we have multidiscipline um, professionals within our offices, real estate, environmental specialists, we've got people that are pavement specialists, and we have planners, and we have uh, any number of bridge structures engineers. Depending on what's involved with the project, and because of the process we have to follow, you will have to reach out and work with any number of people. You've got to coordinate with utilities. You've got to make sure the environmental clearances are done. If there's real estate involved, you've got to make sure it's acquired on time. And if there's relocations, it gets even more complicated. So yes, I think in a sense, by the scope of a project, we do have to form cross-functional teams, as Ernie was talking about. And so in our operations, there is a need to work across professions pretty regularly.
So I don't think that's something you need. Because you're not just staying in the office, are you? No, no. I mean, you're, you're out and you're interacting because the world around us is dictating so much of what we can do and what the scope of our work is. I, I went to a project before I came here and I wrote down every single type of discipline that's on one of our projects down in Texas. We have technology folks, which consist of a number of GIS folks, ITS folks, and basically document management system folks that write software. Okay? We have construction folks. We have communication experts, which are public involvement, as we talked about earlier. Um, we have landscape architects. We have planners, because of the, we're still in the NEPA phase and we're talking about smart growth opportunities. Environmental scientists, finance folks, legal, right-of-way, utilities. My question is, and I'm going I'm to be quiet after this question, do you need to have an engineer to coordinate all that? And I'm not going to answer that. I just want you guys to think about that. Julius told us no earlier really today, and I agree with him. someone who is not an engineer coordinator. But at, at the end of the day, it's an engineering project. And so if you had someone who was an engineer who was also skilled at doing that management, um, then I think you will, have, you will have very strong performance. I'm not going to say superior performance because I don't want to start okay. another argument. <laughs> OK. Mark? Pretty, uh, being from Washington, I'm going to take the politically correct position and say I think everybody's right. <laughs> 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 and, but the difference, I think, going back to what Tom said, the more I would have heard the discussion, it, there is, a, I think, a difference in culture, maybe, and clearly on a lot, of, a lot of levels, but in the university versus the workplace. At the university, students are trying to get ahead. They're trying to get the best grades, get the best experience. They want to come out of that university ready to impress that employer to get that best job available. So it is a more individual kind of, of mentality, if not curriculum. It sounds like the curriculum lends itself that way anyway, at least at the undergraduate level. Yet that they cross over into the workplace, and we're asking them to do just what's been explained here. Work as team members, be leaders, understand the, the various activities and how they fit together. So it's a much more consensus kind of environment that we ask them to walk into in terms of the skills than probably what they were, at least were exposed to to some extent in their development to come in. So but don't you think that a fair number of those 700 people who were on the receiving end of, of Keith's uh, webcast, uh, you know, a significant number of them probably won't his job? And how do you get that? By standing out rather than by blending in. Exactly. So, so you know, we've got to recognize that's probably the culture of the university, but just teach them that this is a skill that you're going to need when you go into the workplace, or at least it's being asked of you in the workplace, because this is how the work's getting done now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, it's, uh, and we'll hear from you know, the university representative this afternoon, but anyway, that's just, just kind of what it, a sense of what I hear from some of this discussion. One final comment, Marie. State's perspective to balance Washington again. <laughs> what I see happening, I, I have a daughter that's still in high school and I have two sons in college, and I can tell you with certainty that more and more of the class work is going towards group project work where they're, they're, yeah, they may still be competing to have the grade point and to get the skills and things like that, but in, in the day-to-day -day curriculum, they're building in more opportunities to work in teams, more opportunities to work on group projects, because I do believe the education community gets it, that that's how we get work done when we get into the real world. So it's one of those interesting dichotomies. They do compete to try and stand out to get the job, but I do believe in the curriculum, they're getting the opportunity to work together in teams to see what it takes to be successful on a project. Well, that sounds like that's what needs to be happening, happen, but is it happening <laughs> consistently enough in the university sector? And maybe it is. I, 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 I'm I not an expert. My three things. I, I, I don't know what OK. I think, I think it's more important, really, in the secondary uh, area. Well, we're seeing, I've, I've got two kids in high school right now, and, and I see it. Uh, real dramatic change in curriculum uh, at that age level to more of a problem-solving sort of approach 
as opposed to the straight facts and figures that we used to learn. And I think that kind of critical thinking is what you're really talking about in a multidisciplinary approach. If we, you know, give, give me a person that's trainable, who's capable of doing more than one thing, I'll put them to work and I'll give them the right thing to do. And, uh, and I, that's what we're looking for, is not specific skills. I think it's the ability to embrace a lot of different skills. Joetta, you can now have the last call. Uh, Howard has been signaling me for the last 15 minutes that our lunch is getting stale. So. Okay. What I wanted to add is I think that we could do that um, with the employer in the academic setting if we not, if the employers wouldn't wait until they get out of college or complete their degrees. If we mirror that while they're in the academic setting with interns and like um, positions, we can start as the employer showing them some of those soft skills that we are looking for while they're still in the academic setting. And then when, if you have a job available, which we kind of do this in Michigan, they hit the door running with some training that we've already provided them. They've got their degree and they're ready to go with that, that training curve that's kind of been minimized now because we've had them for a couple of years as an intern and we've shown them some of the skill sets that we're looking for. Okay. Well, join me in giving the panel a, a round of applause here. I think they've done a, a good job.